I want to bring in Philip Bump here in New York and Ed O'Keefe down in our Washington bureau. Philip is a national correspondent for The Washington Post, and Ed is a CBS News political contributor and a congressional reporter for The Washington Post. Ed, let me start with you. You were there on Capitol Hill. You heard James Comey use that strong language in his testimony. He called President Trump a liar, basically, right out of the gate. There's a lot to choose from here, but what is your takeaway from the hearing? What stood out the most to you? I, I think this is uh, obviously the most vivid and dramatic moment yet in what I like to call the, the Trussia investigation, the Trump-Russia investigation. Oh, I see what you did there. Hashtag Trussia. Uh, okay. And, uh, and I think really helped sort of uh, fill in a lot of... A lot of unanswered questions and, and some of the more uh, vivid details to date about this whole situation. But it was more than anything, Elaine, a reminder that we are far from over with this whole affair. This was one narrow piece of the ongoing probe uh, from, from somebody who obviously played an important role and, and arguably set the plates in motion, uh, but certainly just one of several characters who still need to be interviewed, ideally in public, and will have to explain themselves and their involvement in this. And I think the other important thing to remember, it was right there at the beginning of the hearing. Comey was asked, do you have any concern or doubt that the Russians did indeed try to meddle and that Russian government officials were involved? He said he has no doubt about either of those things. Remember, that was the basis for the beginnings of this, con of this investigation. He confirmed again he has no doubt that that's the case. And he also reminded us that a lot of this also began because of some missteps by folks associated with Hillary Clinton's campaign, chiefly the former president, Bill Clinton. The fact that he boarded Loretta Lynch's plane last summer in Arizona and had a conversation with the attorney general is in part what prompted Comey to take the steps he did to then later explain why he wasn't investigating Hillary Clinton for using a private email server. And one wonders if the former president had never done that, if other things had not happened in the past, whether we'd be sitting here tonight discussing all this. Yeah, really good point. Uh, Philip, what were the takeaways for you? No, I mean, I think Ed hit on most of them. I mean, I think one of the things that was most fascinating to watch was uh, uh, the real-time reaction to what Comey was saying. We came into this knowing the Washington Post, ABC News did a poll yesterday. They showed more than half the country is skeptical of what Comey has to say. That's powered primarily through partisanship. A lot of Republicans are skeptical of it. He's basically viewed about the same as is the media. So people were looking at this as, oh, here's just another person saying these things that they're going to sort of take or leave. In real time, though, I think we saw a lot of uh, effect of what he was saying. The fact that he called the president a liar so directly, the fact that he stuck to his guns, the fact that he was pressed pretty hard by some of these Republican senators. It was, it was a very collegial uh, hearing, absolutely, but he was pressed pretty hard by some of the senators, and he was able to respond, and he presented a case that I think was a pretty effective case for those Americans that were watching, and there were a lot of Americans watching. Do you think, Ed, that lawmakers are going to want to hear more, or do you think that his testimony was adequate for those lawmakers? Yeah, we've got a story publishing tonight, Elaine, that I co-wrote that says that, indeed, they want Comey to come back, mm. specifically to talk to the Senate Judiciary Committee this time. This is the committee that actually has oversight of the FBI, where Comey worked. They want to follow up on some of the things that he said in the Intelligence Committee meeting, and they want to get into some more of the specifics about the oversight and the operations, not only of the FBI, but of the Justice Department, and, and the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General general's involvement in Comey's removal. At this point, they now say, Republicans and Democrats, that Jeff Sessions and Rod Rosenstein are uh, subjects of intrigue, if you will, and they want to hear from them. Sessions is scheduled to be on the Hill next Tuesday for what is seemingly and officially a budget hearing for the Justice Department, but undoubtedly he will get asked some of these questions. We'll see whether or not he answers. The other thing we learned tonight, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee will meet later this month with Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law. He too, of course, is subject to this investigation, apparently is planning to meet with them. They will have questions for him as well. Uh, and, and I think more than anything now, based on what Comey said today, virtually all Democrats and a handful of Republicans acknowledge that there is enough there to continue looking into the possibility that the president himself obstructed justice. Ultimately, that decision isn't made until special counsel Robert Mueller concludes his investigation. And when it is, if he makes that conclusion, he brings it to Congress, and Congress will then decide what it has to do with that information. He can't be charged with obstruction of justice because he's the president. If Congress takes it up, they would take it up, essentially, by holding impeachment hearings. So you mentioned Attorney General Jeff Sessions. What could come of that meeting? Uh, of what meeting? Of, of his, Jeff of his Sessions, the one that he's going to be on Tuesday. Well, right? it's a, it's a, it's it's a, a Senate appropriate. 
it's a Senate yeah. Appropriations Subcommittee hearing, oh. seemingly designed to talk about the budget of the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. But Democrats on that subcommittee tonight said, oh, don't worry, we're going to be asking him all sorts of questions about mm -hmm. what Director Comey had to say. The question is whether Sessions will even acknowledge them, uh, or, or perhaps he'll duck and say this isn't necessarily appropriate setting for that. We asked the Judiciary Committee tonight, the Senate Judiciary Committee, whether they have plans to bring in Sessions and Rosenstein. We haven't heard back. Hmm. All right. Uh, so, Philip, is interesting. President Trump did not tweet about this testimony, but he did say during an event that, quote, we are under siege. What kind of position does James Comey's testimony leave the president of the White House right now? Well, I think it's important to note that this, the, the, the gravity of this situation is reinforced by the fact that for the first time we saw this White House actually go into message lockdown. They sent out talking points last night that people stuck to. Donald Trump didn't get on Twitter. He is right now. It's the fifth longest uh, uh, absence of a tweet that he has had since he announced his candidacy. It is a long period for him to go without tweeting, and that's remarkable. This is the moment we're in, 2017, et cetera. That's remarkable. That shows that they recognize that this was a very serious day. That said, I think that they, is, they seized upon several things that James Comey said uh, as being exculpatory and giving them sort of grounds to say this wasn't that big a deal. They seized upon uh, the fact that, that Comey admitted to having a friend release some information in the New York Times. They seized upon the fact that Comey in his prepared statement said that, in fact, he had told Donald Trump several times that he was not under investigation. Uh, these are the sorts of things that the administration is going to lift up and say, aha, see, we were at all along. This is just a big nothing burger. This is, you know, fake news, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that said, I think there was also a lot of substance, as Ed has pointed out, a lot of substance to this that is going to continue to be a problem for them. And I think they recognize that, too, by the fact that they're continuing to be disciplined about how they respond. So to follow up on that point, um, Ed, let me ask you, the one thing we did hear was Sarah Huckabee Sanders say in an off-camera briefing, the president's not a liar. So what kind of responses, given what we heard from James Comey uh, on Thursday, what kind of responses do you think we should anticipate here, even as the White House tries to basically funnel any and all responses towards the personal attorney of President Trump and not the White House? You mean responses from, from Trump associates and Republicans? Well, from, from the White House itself, from Trump associates, well, from all of it. I think that, well, I, yeah. Yeah, I think the Trump White House now is doing what the Clinton White House did back in the day, which is refer things to the attorneys. And, and for the first time today, really, Trump's attorney finally came out and addressed reporters. He told a lot of uh, half-truths or untruths, frankly, in describing things uh, and, and in the accusations he leveled. Uh, but regardless, he is now starting to speak out and doing so on camera, which is important. Uh, the fact that the White House, however, then deputized about 60 people over at the Republican National Committee to churn the Anthony Comey talking points, I think, is also notable. He's now taking full advantage of the Republican Party's political apparatus to make his case. And repeatedly today in conversations with Republican lawmakers, they were making a, a similar uh, converse, uh, similar point, which is, look, if you were somebody who maybe was under the cloud of investigation and had been told directly by the FBI director that you weren't, wouldn't you be upset that he was refusing to come out and, and say that you were no longer the subject of investigation? Let's give the president the benefit of the doubt there that he was upset, is what Republicans said. The other thing we heard a lot of them say, especially Speaker Ryan, was, remember, this guy is a political novice. He's never done this before. Clearly, he doesn't understand the norms of, of how the president is supposed to interact with law enforcement officials. He was pressed as to whether or not he was making excuses for the president. He said, no, it's an observation. Uh, but other Republicans were making similar points, which is, hey, let's essentially, they were saying, let's give him a pass. He's new at this. Look, you break the law, you break the law. You, you do improper things as president and improperly manage the government, you're going to get called on it because you're the president. Interesting, though, that now, so many weeks and months into this, Republicans seem to have some unity in their explanation, if not a defense, of what the president's up to. Ed, I just want to follow up on something you brought up a moment ago, and that is uh, talking about President Trump's personal attorney, Mark Kasowitz. You said there was a series of half-truths. What half-truths did you well, hear? I'll admit, uh, Elaine, that I've been tied up primarily with what's going on over at the Capitol today. Mm -hmm. But in my read of what he was saying, regarding uh, the president and Comey's interactions, you know, accusations that, uh, you know, that things hadn't been revealed when, in fact, they had been. Mm -hmm. uh, he was referencing something from memos that, in fact, wasn't there or hadn't been revealed that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and he essentially disputed what Comey has now testified under oath, right. which is that uh, the president had asked him to uh, divert the investigation from Michael Flynn. 
you can believe the president or you can believe James Comey. That's up to you. But remember that Comey now has done it under oath to a Senate committee. The president has not. And Philip, uh, one of the things we did hear from Mark Kasowitz was uh, talking about the leaking of uh, privileged communications, right. which is a different thing from right. the leaking of classified information. Yeah, I mean, I think Ed's exactly right. The, 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 the statement the Kasowitz released was very, very uh, pointed in the way that it tried to present what happened today. It's his job. He's an attorney. We get that, right? Uh, but to Ed's point, one of the things he did is he said that the New York Times had reported the existence of a memo before this critical Donald Trump tweet, uh, which wasn't true. That wasn't what was actually in the New York Times report. Uh, he, he also uh, was very careful in how he framed what Comey had done when Comey gave that memo, he gave a memo to a friend to, re to release to the New York Times. And the way that, that Kasowitz framed that was that there were these leaks and uh, of uh, both uh, illegal and improper leaks of classified and privileged communications. And the, what Comey did was not illegal and was not classified, but he lumped it all together to sort of give this impression that Comey had somehow broken the law. It was very deliberate, very pointed, uh, and, and misleading, to Ed's point. Right. Uh, and I think that it's important people re realize that. Right. And to underscore, I mean, James Comey himself made it a point to say during his testimony that the way he wrote those memos was so that it would not be classified That's information. Exactly right. All right, Philip Bump here in New York, Ed O'Keefe in Washington. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Take care.